Добрый день, шановные коллеги. Позвольте вам представить профессора Даниэла Брукса, члена Канадского Королевского Наукового Товариства, так само и члена Лондонского Линеевского Товариства. Доповедь Perfect Storm Climate Change Disease и мы буде представлена англійською мовою, але я просив, щоб це було дещо адаптовано для нашого. Якщо у когось потім після доповіді будуть питання, то ви можете їх задавати, навіть якщо ці питання будуть українською. Якщо можна, то англійською, але ми що-небудь придумаємо. Дякую за увагу. <laughs> First of all, I would like to uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, even before 1989, there were a few things about this part of the world that North Americans knew, and one of them was, was this research institute and, and the, the history of the researchers in it. But when I was a student growing up in Washington, D.C., in, back in the Pleistocene, I never had any, any hope that I would ever see this place. And so it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful honor to be here on, on many levels. Um, the problem is that today my job is to ruin your day and change your life, especially for the students. Uh, the good news is I will not be speaking in Hungarian. The bad news is I will not be speaking in Ukrainian. So you'll have to put up with something in the middle, which is American English, or what Americans call English. Now, the problem, okay? The problem is that there are a lot of diseases on this planet. And there are new diseases and outbreaks of old diseases in new places and in new hosts every day. There are websites like Outbreak.com that are just, if you want to feel like the world is coming to an end, just read Outbreak.com every morning. This is a long list. Today, the newest, the newest uh, news today is that there's probably going to be a major dengue fever outbreak in the Caribbean this year. Oh, wonderful. But even worse than that is that now, when we hear news like that, we go, oh, yeah, it's another disease outbreak. And this is an indication of, of how great the problem is. So we have diseases that are emerging on this planet every day. They are not just affecting human beings. They're also affecting the plants and animals that we depend on for food and, and for commerce. And these outbreaks are happening much more rapidly than our theories about the evolution of pathogen host systems would predict. So this is not just a problem for the world at large, for the practical world. This is also a challenge for evolutionary biology because clearly we have been missing something. We failed to anticipate the emerging disease crisis. If you just read the, the, the newspaper reports, the news accounts, the online news accounts, you might have the impression that the emerging disease problem is just a problem that's associated with a few really nasty viruses in the tropics, things like Zika and, and Ebola and dengue. But the reality is that viral infections actually are the least expensive kind of pathogens on the planet. Bacterial infections cost the world much more than viruses every year. Helminths and protists cost the world more than bacteria every year. And we are now seeing old diseases returning. So malaria has now returned to southern Europe. Uh, schistosomiasis has been reestablished on Corsica. And after five years, 
the public health people have decided that perhaps there's a non-human reservoir on Corsica that explains this. So we're, being, we're very, very slow to react. We're very slow to, to understand what's happening. We're not anticipating. Three years before the malaria outbreaks in Tuscany, southern France, and southern Switzerland last August, three years before that, a research group in Spain had published an article saying, Anopheles mosquitoes are now capable of surviving the winters in southern Europe because the winter temperatures are mild enough. Nobody paid any attention. And in fact, when a six-year-old Italian girl died in a hospital in Tuscany, the hospital spokesman said, we don't understand this. This little girl never traveled outside of Italy, and we know there's no malaria in Italy. So we don't understand how this happened. This is the state of the world. This is the state of our preparedness now. They are everywhere. They're transmitted in everything we do. Every, everything we do as human beings can bring us into contact in one way or another, potentially with a pathogen. The same thing is true for our crops and our livestock. They're found in rural areas. They're found in urban areas. They're found in the wildlands, basically everywhere. They're in developing countries, they're in developed countries, they're in the tropics, and they're outside of the tropics now. And they're moving out of the tropics even faster than the tropics is expanding north and south. They are a national security problem for every country on this planet. They're a problem for water security, food security, public health security, socio-cultural security, and this includes things like coping with, with migrants, and economic security, because every, every country in the world has budget problems right now. And any increased expense on the public health system or the agricultural health system means less money someplace else. And it's costly. It's much more costly than anybody associated with organizations like the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control will admit in public. It took Eric Hoberg and Walter Wieger and me six months to dig out even a conservative estimate of how much emerging infectious diseases are costing the planet every year now. And a conservative estimate is larger than the GDP, the gross domestic product, of all but 15 countries. If Hungary wanted to pay the bill for the world's emerging disease costs for one year, it would cost them their GDP for four years. And the countries, of course, that are most heavily hit by emerging diseases are the ones that cannot afford it the most. They're the ones that, are, that have the least money. So there's a really, really big problem. If we are not already at a point where health care costs are unsustainable, we will be there very shortly, globally. There is no country on the planet that is, that is not falling behind with respect to uh, the amount of money they have to pay for health care, for diseases, for emerging diseases, and how, how, much, how little return they're getting for their money. So the question for evolutionary biologists, because one of the things we say in, in, our, in our book that's coming out next year is that it's nobody's fault, but everybody's to blame. And the scientific community has a lot of blame. Evolutionary biologists in particular, as I said, we failed to anticipate the emerging disease crisis. And we, and we failed to anticipate it because during the 1950s and 1960s and on, we created models of coevolution that kept us from recognizing what was happening when it was happening. So we not only don't understand why there is this emerging disease crisis, we don't understand why we're losing the battle. So what's wrong with us? at the evolutionary biologists in the audience, people like me. And the problem is that our scientific beliefs about the nature of pathogen host systems and the evolution and ecology of pathogen host systems 
does not correspond with what we're actually seeing today. So we have a very drastic mismatch between theory and observation. Now, the 20th century, there were two major models of coevolution. There was, there was a lot of activity. There was a lot of thought for 100 years about what we now call evolution. But by the end of the 20th century, those, those thoughts had coalesced into two major categories. There are two major classes of coevolutionary models. One is called the coevolutionary arms race model, um, which, which developed in the United States, not surprisingly, in the middle of the Cold War, and so it, that's why it ended up being called the coevolutionary arms race model. Um, and then more, gener more recently, there is John Thompson's coevolution, geographic mosaic theory of coevolution. Now, the coevolutionary arms race model. Uh, which is usually associated with a paper in 1964 by Ehrlich and Raven in the journal Evolution, but which was actually described mathematically in a paper also in Evolution six years before Ehrlich and Raven published their paper, and they never cited it, uh, by a mathematician named Mode. And the reason Ehrlich and Raven didn't cite Mode's paper was because Mode was working with agricultural diseases. And Ehrlich and Raven were working with butterflies and plants. Obviously, these things must not have anything to do with each other. And yet, they both described exactly the same phenomenon. And that's one in which you have a theory of progressive specialization, ecological specialization, in the association between particular pathogens and their hosts, with the pathogens evolving traits to attack the hosts and the hosts counter-evolving traits to defend themselves uh, from the pathogens. The geographic mosaic theory of coevolution allows the possibility of coevolutionary arms race interactions but doesn't require it. Okay, coevolution, it's in some ways it's a more general model. Coevolution, according to Thompson's theory, occurs when generalist parasites are distributed among distributed among a multiple hosts in different places. Each of the hosts is assumed to represent a slightly different resource, slightly different selection regime, and when these different host pathogen populations are isolated geographically, you have the emergence of multiple new specialist pathogen host situations. Now, the interesting thing about this is that both of these categories of models agree on one thing, that pathogens are highly specialized on their hosts, and once a strong coevolutionary dynamic has been established, the longer the host and pathogen are associated with each other, the less the chances that that pathogen is going to be capable of moving into a new host. In other words, coevolution, coevolutionary co thought, as of the end of the 20th century, led us to believe that evolution was the best firewall we had against emerging diseases. Coevolution was going to keep emerging diseases at a minimum because emerging disease requires that pathogens get into new hosts. And this led to, in the early 20th century, to what the insect plant people, uh, people like Sal Augusta, called the paradox, the parasite paradox or the pathogen paradox. There are not an equal number of generalist and specialist pathogens on this planet. There are not an equal number of generalist and specialist herbivorous insects on this planet. The vast majority of them are highly specialized, especially with respect to host range. That is the number of, the number of hosts utilized. But it also turns out that host range within groups of pathogens including within groups of, of phytophagous insects, host range changes over time. And we have all of these emerging diseases occurring in real time. So something is going on much more rapidly and in a much more complicated way than, than our coevolutionary models of the 20th century suggested. Phylogenetic comparisons, which were not possible until the second half, no, the last 25 years of the 20th century, essentially, all of them have shown that, this, that pathogens moving around among hosts and changing 
their host range through time is actually the evolutionary pattern. This has always been the case. So we need a new paradigm of, of something. We don't even know what to call it. Well, we do. I called it the Stockholm paradigm because most of the insights that I've gained about it were, were done in conjunction with, with collaborations with the insect plant people at Stockholm University. So how do we resolve this paradox that pathogens are in fact highly specialized ecologically, most of them at any one point in time in any one place have very restricted host ranges, but they're capable of moving among hosts really readily. Well, it turns out that one of the things we have to explain is this whole business about host range evolution. Okay, I'm not going to use the term host specificity because we don't believe that there is any such thing as host specificity. Just as I'm not going to use terms specialist and generalist because those are non-evolutionary terms. Organisms can specialize or generalize, but specialists and generalists can't. They are either one thing or another. And so they either exist or they go extinct. They don't diversify. And part of the problem we've had is the language that we've used. And the history of some of that language is quite interesting and it was quite rational at one point in time, but it's not working. Okay. So here's what we find when we look at host range, that is the number of host species and the phylogenetic breadth, the phylogenetic distribution of host species utilized by particular groups of pathogens or Phytophagus insects, what we find is that over time, the host range expands and contracts and expands and contracts and expands and contracts. Now, we have a really good theory to explain how things that are generalized can become specialized. I mean, we know that really well. In fact, Darwin's entire theory was based on the assumption that everything is specialized in some way. That's what he, those were the adaptations. But what we've never had is an explanation for how something that was highly specialized could be generalized. So if evolution or coevolution is some sort of process of continually producing new specialists, where do the generalists come from? Now you might be interested to know that the concept of ecological generalists is only about 50 years old. Until about 50 years ago, nobody, no, it never even occurred to anybody that there was, could even be any such thing. It was a, an idea that was thought up to try to explain this problem of, of how do we get new specialists all the time. So what, what this, this oscillation is what we call the, what the Swedes call the oscillation hypothesis. This phylogenetic pattern of host range is doing this in evolutionary time, what that implies is not only that generalized species can become highly specialized, but also that highly specialized species can become generalized. So that there's one general mechanism that explains both the host range expansion and the host range contraction, or the generalization and specialization, generalization and specialization. And it turns out that the key element to this is understanding a concept that Dan Jansen proposed in 1985 called ecological fitting. Basically what ecological fitting says is this. Every species lives in a place doing something that works really well for where they live and what's available to them. But every one of those species could live someplace else as well. Now in terms of pathogen host associations, what that means is that even if a pathogen occurs in only one place and infects only one host in that one place, that pathogen will still be capable without any new genetic mutations at all Will, will be, is capable of infecting other hosts in other places. So that means that the capacity 
to live in multiple hosts is always present in pathogens that are highly specialized. Everything we measure about them in terms of their transmission dynamics, their microhabitat preferences are, are highly specialized. But their host range restriction, the number of hosts that they infect, is highly contextual. It's not a built-in genetic deficit. It's contextual. It's part of their ecology. It's part of their ecological context. And we can always assume that there are other species in other places that are susceptible to any pathogen, any particular pathogen, but are not infecting, the pathogen's not infecting those other hosts simply because they have never come into contact with each other. And one of the side products of that is that if you've never come into contact with a pathogen before, even though you're susceptible, there's been no possibility of selection for resistance in your population. So that means two things. If you ever come into contact with that pathogen, that pathogen will recognize you as just more of the same real estate and will immediately add you to its list of hosts. And you will have no resistance to it. And this is because, and as I said, I don't, we're, we don't use the term host specificity anymore because pathogens are not specialized on hosts. They're specialized on traits that hosts have. So there's no, no conflict between saying that pathogens are extremely ecologically specialized and saying there's no such thing as host specificity. And the reason for that is because the traits that pathogens are specialized on are found in hosts. So of course there's some correlation between hosts and pathogens. But this is one of the things that the phylogenetics revolution showed us was that there are a whole lot of ways that this can be true. For example, here's sort of the, the, the you know, the old-fashioned model of, of host pathogen associations. So here's, here's host G, and up here this I, that one, that's the pathogen. And this is... The, the pathogen is restricted to the host. This is what we would call extreme host specificity, okay, or very specialized pathogen. And what I've done here on the phylogeny of the host is I've made this line very thick. And that represents the phylogenetic distribution of the resource or resource base that the pathogens are specialized on. And in this particular case, because the pathogen is specialized on a resource that is only found in one host, that pathogen can only survive in one host. That pathogen still has the ability to move around if the host moves around geographically. But the pathogen is restricted to that one host. Now, what happens if that same resource now is distributed among three different species of hosts? It's the same resource. All three species of hosts have that same highly specialized resource because they're all closely related to each other. And that means that if this, if this parasite, this pathogen, is normally only found in host G, if that pathogen ever came into contact with F or H, we would have to predict that it would immediately move into those hosts because as far as the pathogen is concerned, those are not three different host species, they are all the same thing. Because what the pathogen is specialized on is characteristics of the host, not the host species. So in this particular case, we would say, oh, oh, look, the pathogen's becoming a generalist. No, it's not. It's still highly specialized. In fact, nothing has changed about the evolutionary status of the pathogen. All that's changed is the number of susceptible hosts that are exposed. Now here's a situation in which we have the same sort of deal. All right. So now we have three hosts that all have the same resource. Now this, in this case, that resource is very ancient. So the three hosts are not closely related to each other. 
But the resource that they share in common is a common evolutionary inheritance. They all have it for the same evolutionary reason. And in this particular case, you could have a situation in which the pathogen could infect all three of those hosts without becoming a generalist, without any kind of coevolutionary interactions at all, simply because all, of those, all three of those hosts have the same resource. And it's a very specialized resource. You can also, of course, have a situation in which that same resource has evolved convergently. So it turns out that pathogen-host associations, once you understand that what pathogens are specialized on are resources of the host, which means traits, and you begin to look at the issue of pathogen-host association in terms of trait evolution, it turns out that, in fact, there never was any reason to believe that pathogens would be so locked into one host that they couldn't do anything. There is, in fact, the, the resolution of the paradox, the parasite paradox is that highly specialized host traits can have a very broad phylogenetic distribution. And if the phylogenetic distribution of the host trait is greater than the geographic distribution of the pathogen, there will always be hosts out there somewhere that are susceptible right now if the pathogen only finds them. We have to ask whether or not we as a scientific community have been lying to ourselves. Okay? This is an example that is found in a number of, of English language first year evolutionary biology textbooks. And it is called an example of mirror coevolution, co-speciation. This is given as an example of hosts and parasite phylogenies being exactly the same, except it's a lie. I mean, it's a lie. It's just simply untrue. And in fact, these dots represent every place that there isn't co-speciation. And the dotted lines represent additional places where the pathogens have jumped into new hosts. And this is, this is called the classic case of co-speciation. And 50% of this, I mean, this is actually pretty high for real data sets because almost 50% of the associations in this are the result of co-speciation. In most cases, it's not nearly that much. Okay, so second of all is this issue of how some, a specialist Okay, how specialized species can generalize. In other words, it's not only a situation in which generalized species become specialized and then that's it. There is a mechanism whereby highly specialized species can generalize themselves. And that's allowed by what, what Sal Augusta has called sloppy fitness space. The recognition that fitness space or all of the dimensions on this planet where a given species of any kind could exist if it were in that place is in fact sloppy. Most of the potential viable fitness space for every species on this planet is unoccupied by the species. So this is an example. If you have three host species that all have the same specialized resource, but the pathogen only lives in a place where one of those species occur, you've got these two whole species of hosts out there that make the fitness space for the pathogen very sloppy. In fact, the pathogen's only occupying one-third of all of its possible fitness space. So it always has options, even no matter how specialized it is. And ecological fitting connects with this by recognizing that, that, that the fitness space for pathogens, okay, which includes all of the hosts and all of the trophic interactions that are necessary to maintain a viable uh, pathogen population, th that includes hosts that the pathogens have used in the past but don't use now, pathogens, uh, hosts that the pathogens are currently using, and hosts that the pathogens could use, but currently are not exposed. 
So that's, that's the dimension of parasite fitness space. The so-called cophylogeny studies are, are an interesting, they're an interesting exercise in academic um, denial. The cophylogeny studies, basically, the methods were developed to help us maintain the mythology that there was any co-speciation between pathogens and hosts, despite the evidence. The cophylogeny studies are basically methods that are designed to allow you to believe that any amount of host switching is the result of cryptic co-speciation. The reality is that what cophylogeny studies do is give us an estimate of how sloppy the fitness space is for, for any given pathogen. So, for example, if, if we, we go back to, to the, uh, the lice and, and, uh, uh, and fleas, look at this. Here are the places where you have so episodes of host switching, episodes of, of host range expansion in history. The first thing to notice, and we'll come back to this, is that, oh look, there's sort of co-speciation switching, co-speciation switching. It's oscillating. So you, you see evidence of the oscillation hypothesis here. And when you begin to look at the total range of hosts that are viable, given the known host switching episodes, you begin to realize that the potential range of hosts that could be occupied is enormous. And yet, there's, there, is no, there is no indication that any of those fleas are anything except highly specialized ecologically. So this is not a situation in which we're producing lots of new specialists or anything like that. This is just a situation in which Given the opportunity, pathogens will exploit more of their available, highly specialized fitness space. So it's, it's about opportunity. Okay? It's about new opportunities. Being introduced to hosts that are already susceptible, but you've never seen them before. It's not about the evolution of new genetic information. The expansion of host range as a result of ecological fitting and sloppy fitness space is what allows the possibility for a highly specialized pathogen to become much more generalized in fitness space, setting up the possibility of secondary specializations occurring after the fact. So the emergence of new genetic information that's very specific in specific places is a consequence of host switching. It's not a cause of host switching. And what creates new opportunities for pathogens? Oh God, it's climate change. Whew. Thank goodness I'm from the United States and there's no climate change in my country. Otherwise, we'd be in big trouble like the rest of the world. The climate change is the single factor that we have found, and I'm going to show you a couple of phylogenetic studies. Every phylogenetic study we've done has found the following pattern. Not only is there no co-speciation, there's a lot of host switching, but the host switching doesn't happen periodically throughout time. The host switch happens in bursts. And from... The, the, the molecular dating evidence and the geographic context evidence that we have, what we've discovered is that every one of those bursts of host switching, host range expansion in phylogeny, the host range oscillations, every one of those is tightly correlated with a major episode of global or regional climate change in the past. So that's the direct link between climate change and the emerging disease crisis. And we're still hoping that, that medical doctors and veterinarians will, will stop being creationists and start becoming real biologists and understand that they're dealing with an evolutionary problem. Because that's one of, the, one of the issues we have right now, is that 
we don't have enough public and veterinary health and agricultural health people who understand that this is an evolutionary phenomenon at work. So the relationship between sloppy fitness space and ecological fitting is the, the relationship between opportunity and capacity. There's always potential opportunity for pathogens to occupy more geographic space and more hosts than it appears at any point, any one point in time. And there's always the capacity to do that because the highly specialized host resources that pathogens require and the trophic interactions that are necessary to maintain the transmission of the parasite generation to generation are highly conservative phylogenetically. So they're everywhere. And that's what allows ecological fitting to happen. Now, there is, this is still incomplete because the oscillation hypothesis at this point, we add ecological fitting and, and sloppy fitness space to it, the oscillation hypothesis still basically says that a group will oscillate, the host range will oscillate, enlarge, get small, enlarge, get small, enlarge, get small, until all pathogens are maximally, finally distributed among all hosts. And then it would stop. So at this point, we still have an incomplete explanation because we don't have any mechanism for the continued diversification of these groups of parasites. And after all, remember that more than 50% of the species on this planet are pathogens, so we really do need a general explanation for, for how these things diversify. And what drives that diversification? Well, it's climate change again. What drives the diversification is the opening up of fitness space, increasing connections among fitness space that were not there before, or changing the geographic distribution of fitness space. And that requires an external driver. That's not something that the parasites and the hosts do to themselves. So external perturbations drive the exploration of sloppy fitness space. I mean, it's that simple. What climate change does is climate change allows things to move around. That's all it takes. It just, things move. And when things move, they come into contact with opportunities that they never knew existed before. And if we're not paying attention, then those pathogens that are moving around are going to come into contact with us, our children, our livestock, our crops, and we're not going to be prepared for it, and the economic impacts are going to be devastating. So the final element in the Stockholm paradigm is the biogeographic driver, the external driver, this phenomenon called the taxon pulse, which Terry Irwin, an, an entomologist at the Smithsonian, actually proposed in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and it was ignored by uh, the... the uh, phylogenetic biogeographers. And the taxon pulse hypothesis basically says that the geographic distributions of related species are the result of alternating episodes, oscillating episodes, if you will, of post range expansion, isolation, and speciation, then subsequent expansion and isolation, expansion and isolation, and during the periods of expansion, the species are responding to climate change by moving away from deteriorating habitat into areas where the habitat is what they prefer. In other words, most of what happens when climate change occurs, species do not stay in one place and magically evolve adaptations to stay in that place. Mostly, they run away. If it's getting drier, they move trying to find a wetter place. If it's getting wetter, they move away trying to find a drier place. And when these move away from here, these guys move in. Now, during periods of isolation, which are periods in which species are restricted or specialized in fitness space, that's when you have the possibility of evolutionary innovations occurring. So let's assume that you have one expansion event, and then you have an isolation event that, that splits that one ancestral species into 30 different species somewhere. 
And let's assume that in only one of those 30 places, the isolated population evolves some novel kind of ecology, some novel host use. When the next episode of climate change occurs and all those isolated pieces of fitness space are reconnected, that one species with the new characteristic has 29 other places it can colonize without competing with any of its relatives because it's already different from its relatives. So you only have to have evolutionary innovations occur one every 30 speciation events in order to produce very complex ecosystems that are made up of things that have colonized each other multiple times, which is what we see. And this produces what we call reticulated area relationships. That is, all the species living in one particular place are not there for the same reason. They don't all have the same history with respect to how they arrived in that place. And that those histories are, are different histories of expansion and isolation, expansion and isolation, or generalizing and specializing, generalizing and specializing, that sometimes are specific to particular clades and sometimes are parts of very general patterns like general responses to, to major climate change events. So here's an example from some parasites. Um, this has to do with an analysis of just two groups of, of nematode parasites in humans and great apes. Turns out that human beings, part of the story of, of humanity and, and our disease burden is that when we moved out of the forest into the savannas to two million years ago, we probably only had about 10 or 15 different species of pathogens infecting us. Today, as a result of all of our human evolution, all of our amazing advancements, we have about 1,500 pathogens that we've acquired as a result of moving around, building cities, domesticating things, and all those wonderful things we've done have always been accompanied by an accumulation of pathogens. So it turns out that if you want to do a deep history analysis of humans and other primates with respect to coevolution, you don't have many options. There just aren't that many groups of pathogens. And these are two of them, pinworms and hookworms. And this particular diagram is not a phylogeny of, of the hosts. This is a historical map of the distribution among hosts of the species of pathogens of parasites in these two nematode groups. And the heavy lines, these thick lines, are the places where the pathogen and host relationships correspond with each other. And all of these thin lines are places where there was major host switching events. Now, the thing that's important about this is that these two groups of parasites are again supposed to be prime examples of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the host phylogeny and the parasite phylogeny. And it's about, about 40% that, about 60% host switching. And the interesting thing about this is that all but one of those host switches involves great apes and their closest relatives. So what you have is the host switching is not random. The new hosts that are being colonized are closely related. They're not sister groups. They're not, it's not a co-speciation thing, but it's more a co-phylogeny thing. The pathogens are, the hosts are closely related enough that they have common resources that the parasites recognize, but they're not each other's closest relatives. So most of, with one exception, all of those host switches are the result of ecological fitting. So Conditions changed, hosts moved from one place to another, bringing their pathogens with them. The pathogens met another host that they liked just as well, and so they decided to infect them too. So now let's look at the hosts. And then the great apes, so the hominoids since the Miocene. It's about the age of, of these parasite groups. But we're not going to look at just the hominoid hosts. We're going to look at the hominoid hosts with respect to two other groups 
of, of vertebrates that they're highly associated, that hominoids are highly associated with in the fossil record, the elephants and hyenas. And what's it look like? Well, it turns out, this again, this is not a phylogeny of areas. Okay? This is a map of the geographic distributions of hominoids and elephants and hyenas since the Miocene. And every one of these thick lines, and in fact the thin lines are so small you don't really see them here, but there are a couple here and there's one here and one there. Those thin lines are places where only one of those three groups of hosts did something that the other two groups did not do. So even though this is very complicated, it's a complicated history that was shared by humans and elephants and hyenas and presumably all the plants they were eating and lions and tigers and everything else. So this is just a little exemplar for a larger system. And it turns out that what the, the, the summary of that picture is the following. What you have is out of Africa into Asia, isolation in Asia, out of Asia into Africa, isolation in Africa, out of Africa back into Asia, back and forth and back and forth. That explains, for one thing, that explains why the steppe habitats of Central, Eastern Europe and, and Western Asia, of, of Eurasia, that's why the greatest diversity and abundance of elephant fossils are there, because that was the highway. They went back and forth, and that was, that was the area that experienced the largest number of movements, west to east, east to west, west to east, east to west. So if somebody says, so what do you believe about human evolution, out of Africa or out of Asia? And you say, yes. Yes, indeed. And it turns out that this is, this is a, a, a very old, this is a 12 or 15 million year pat, old pattern. But it turns out for the last 15,000 years, human beings have been doing the same thing. Every time the climate has changed in the last 12 to 15,000 years, human beings responded to climate change by moving away if they could, coping with the change situations if they could, and dying if they could not. And that's kind of the story of, of evolution. So it turns out that, that what we would expect to find is clusters of host range expansions that are correlated with climate change events. And that's exactly what we find in all of these, all of these studies that have been done so far. So the Stockholm paradigm is a dynamic hypothesis about the interplay between capacity and opportunity in which changes in opportunity, ecological opportunity drive the system and allow the subsequent evolution of new capacities. This is one of the reasons that disease emergence can be so rapid. We don't have to wait for some new mutation that allows the pathogen to jump into a new host before it happens. And that's why you can have these really rapid breakouts of disease once a new host has been colonized, has been added to the repertoire, the pathogen is then more generalized in its fitness space and that allows a greater possibility for those kinds of strange new mutations to show up. This is one of the reasons that we understand that the geographic distribution of disease is always less than the geographic distribution of the pathogen. And we also know that the outbreak of disease, especially highly pathogenic versions of the disease, are almost always associated with the margins of the geographic distribution of the pathogen because that's where they're expanding into new fitness space and coming into contact with susceptible hosts that have never seen them before and therefore have no resistance. So evolutionary Biology, basic evolutionary biology, is, is important in 
trying to cope with the crisis of emerging diseases. As host range expansions are going to occur, that is generalizing by highly specialized pathogens, will occur wherever and whenever geographic distributions and or trophic connections are altered. And the drivers are climate change and secondarily now human population, especially population density, and globalization. I mean, one of, the, one of the worst things that humanity ever did to itself with respect to disease was to urbanize. In 1918, 100 years ago, this coming November, the, the so-called Spanish influenza pandemic infected 25% of the human beings on this planet. And it killed 10% of all of the humans on this planet. Influenza is a, a, a pathogen that is transmitted directly, and so the probability of transmission is directly proportional to population density. We currently have 4.5 times more human beings on this planet than in 1918, and 4.6 times as many people living in cities as in 1918. And we have not been able to reconstruct the, the variant of influenza that caused that pandemic. So it's not one of the variants that's included in any of the annual vaccines. We don't know what happened. We literally don't know at a molecular level what that was. But we do know, we know, that the ecological conditions, the opportunity for a much more devastating influenza pandemic exist. And we've created those conditions for ourselves, and we've made them worse by everything that our cities have done, like heavy industry, that has altered the trajectory for climate change. So it's like I said, it's nobody's fault, but everybody's to blame. I mean, nobody, nobody intended to do this. Everybody thought they were doing something good, and we, we, we really hurt ourselves. The pathogenicity is not caused by genetic changes, caused by climate change. That's because it's just a matter of susceptible hosts with no resistance. Um, uh, well, I'm not, let me not worry about that. We've already talked about this. Um, we have to assume that there are many, many, many potential disease outbreaks waiting to happen. And remember, we're talking about not just diseases in humans. We're talking about livestock. We're talking about crops. Some of you may know that there's a rust fungus uh, that's broken out in the Middle East that is moving north and west that does not respond to any known fungicide. Agricultural economists in, in Europe are now talking about the economic and nutritional impact of the extinction of wheat within 20 years. As 27% of the calories that human beings eat every day on this planet is wheat. Wheat, rice, and corn, three species of plants, 67% of all of the calories that human beings eat every day. And we've done this to ourselves. I mean, wheat, corn, and rice, we focus on them because we can get big yields out of them. But part of the cost of growing big yield crops is that they're highly susceptible to disease. So this is how we create this minefield of, of potential disease outbreaks. They can happen rapidly, they can happen quickly. We have to assume today that what we are seeing today is only the beginning of the really bad emerging disease crisis. What we're seeing today is nothing compared to what 30 years will look, from now will look like. And we have no reason to believe that the host range expansions will stop until climate change fluctuations stop, and we don't know when that's going to be. Climate change fluctuations are not going to stop for the foreseeable future. That is, not for the next 100 or 200 years. So this is essentially a permanent condition especially if you have children or grandchildren. And it also turns out that what we're seeing with the Stockholm paradigm and pathogens and hosts is not restricted to pathogens and hosts. In fact, 
it seems that this is exactly what has happened to all of life on this planet evolutionarily every time there have been major climate change events. And this is, this is a, a passage from one of, of Alicia Stegall's work dealing with periods 500, 600 million years ago. And the pattern is the same. The environment changes as a result of climate change. Species try to move away from the environment that's changing in ways that they're not adapted to. If they can move away and find good environment, they will survive. If they don't, they will die. The vast majority of extinctions are the failure to escape. You know, if, you, if you're not able to expand into new fitness area and survive long enough to come up with a solution to the climate change, you'll die. And that's why we have uh, episodes of 50 or 60 percent of the world's biodiversity going extinct during major climate change events. Because as Darwin pointed out, you can't always get, oh no, that's right, that was the Rolling Stones that said you can't always get what you want. But Darwin said it first. It basically, Darwin said, you know, just because the environment changes doesn't mean you magically get to adapt to it. Usually, you don't. So, this thinking, this, this paradigm, this Stockholm business, can be applied to a lot of different things because host range expansion, geographic expansion, it's the same phenomenon we talk about when we talk about invasive species and introduced species, and why sometimes introduced species do really well. It's the same thing we talk about when we try to understand why biological control programs so often fail. But the good news is that ecological fitting also explains why we don't necessarily expect entire ecosystems to completely collapse when key species go extinct. So this idea of a, a trophic cascade, you knock out a few keystone species and everything collapses, that's, that will happen if there's no such thing as ecological fitting. If there is ecological fitting, then when this species goes extinct, we suddenly discover that this species here would have done this if this species had never been there. So this species goes extinct, this species just moves over and goes, ah, I'm glad that guy's gone. And it turns out then that maybe we don't have such catastrophic ecosystem collapses as we were worried about. So the news is not all bad. It's, it's mostly bad, but it's not all bad. We have to understand that the period of time that we're living through now is one of these evolutionary episodes, and it really doesn't matter who caused it or what caused it. We are in a period of time one of those evolutionary episodes in which the old is passing away and it's setting the stage for the new to emerge. And the emerging disease crisis tells us that the biosphere is beginning to cope with climate change the way it always has. But we have to understand that biological evolution does not care about any particular species no matter how self-important it is. The reality is we get to choose whether we're going to go extinct or not. The biosphere is simply going to cope with climate change and we can decide whether we want to be part of that or whether we just want to pretend that there's no problem and then we die and it's not a problem because I'll be dead before my grandchildren have any problems, so who cares, right? Well, it turns out that there are, th there are things we can do if we decide to do it. Okay, so we have to start with this notion that we need to do something that human beings are capable of doing but never do very well, which is we're always capable of anticipating the future, but rarely do we do anything about that. Okay, I can anticipate that because of my ancestry and because I'm fat that I'm at risk for a heart attack. Am I losing weight? <laughs> Right? So, all human beings are not particularly good about acting on the future. 
But we're in a situation now where if we as a species don't, anticip don't act on what we're anticipating, the results could be devastating. The time is short, the danger is great, and we are largely unprepared. By 2050, the World Economic Forum estimates that 100% of all agricultural soils on this planet will be completely depleted. We will be growing food hydroponically by 2050. The Melbourne Sustainable Studies Institute estimates that by 2050, a combination of conflict, migration, disease, starvation, flood, and drought will have eliminated the human overpopulation problem because half of the human population of today will be gone. That we will be from 7.5 million down to less than 4 million, 4 billion people by 2050. But bear in mind that because more than 50% of human beings live in cities now, and that's where all of our technology is centered, if we lose 50% of humanity abruptly in the next 30 years, we're going to lose substantial amounts of our technological infrastructure. And so they anticipate that by 2050, living conditions on this planet will resemble the beginning of the 20th century. This is, this is not good. I mean, this is really not good. And I don't know about you, but I have children and stepchildren and grandchildren, and all of them, like I have three, I have three wonderful Hungarian stepsons, and if I drop them in the middle of Beijing tomorrow with their cell phones, they could survive just fine. But if I take them out into the forest in the northern part of Hungary without their cell phones and say survive, they're dead. Because one of the things we've done by making ourselves urbanized and urbanized species is that we have created two, at least two generations of people now who find it almost impossible to live outside of a highly technological niche. When Hurricane Katrina ruined the city of New Orleans 10 years ago, within 72 hours of losing electricity and transport into the city, people were killing each other for food. And these are, these are some realities that, that we have to face and we can change that. With respect to emerging diseases, we have to be proactive. We have to stop waiting until the next big outbreak happens and then heroically respond to it. Because, let's face it, my doctor is right. If I lose weight and do not have a heart attack, that's going to be better for me and it's going to be cheaper for the healthcare system than if I stay fat, I have a heart attack, and they have to save me with coronary bypass surgery and then I have to change my diet anyway. So I might as well do it now, right? And save some money. Most of the money, that trillion dollars a year that's being spent on emerging diseases is not spent on huge global pandemics like the ones that Bill Gates is, is warning about now. All of those are what we call death by a thousand cuts. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. that completely preoccupies all of the existing resources of agriculture and public health systems worldwide, which means that when a big pandemic happens, there aren't any resources left to deal with them. And we're not planning for this. We're not anticipating it. The world's public health and veterinary and agricultural health people act like the next report of an emerging disease is the last one that will ever happen. And it's partly because They've been trained in a paradigm of coevolution that is manifestly not true. What we need to do now, and, and it's with emerging diseases, you could put in food, water, uh, warming, sea level rises, any of the threat multipliers for climate change in there. What we need now is policies that, that anticipate the future. We have to anticipate that things are going to get worse for us. We have to accept that, and then we have to adapt to what's coming. We can no longer afford to pretend that either nothing's happening 
or once it happens, we can fix it. Because the only way we can fix what's coming at us is to adapt to it. We will not magically come up with the right adaptation. When the Greenland ice sheet falls into the Atlantic Ocean, New York City will have three hours to evacuate. They are not going to magically come up with a solution at that point to save themselves. They will die. We are already moving into a world where there are two kinds of places for human beings. The places that people are running away from and places that are people are running to. And both of those situations have severe consequences for our future as a technological species. We need to try to buy time. We need to try to adapt to what's coming and to accept what's coming. With respect to emerging diseases, we need to do what we call finding them before they find us. We need to know what's coming. If there's malaria in southern Switzerland, there is nothing to keep that malaria from coming through on a straight line through southern Austria right to Lake Balaton in Hungary within three years. So, what do you do about it? What do you do? Well, it turns out that the answer is both simple and really complicated because we have a, we have a protocol. We know what to do. We know how to get people out there, citizen scientists working with, with highly technologically people and you know, all this, this good technology and stuff. We know how to get out there and find this stuff and track it as it's coming towards us. We know how to teach people how to mitigate the possibility of, of getting malaria by doing things like looking for mosquito larvae in the bird bath in your garden and dumping them out. We know how to do that. There are a lot of things we could do. The problem is this requires a degree of cooperation among human beings that humanity has never done before. I mean, in particular, doing something to protect your country from emerging diseases requires that you help the countries that are the sources of those diseases coming at you, even if you don't like them. So, for example, you know, Hungarians, well, Hungarians sort of don't like anybody, but they mostly don't like people coming from parts of the world that used to occupy them. What a surprise, right? You used, you, know, you used to occupy our country, we don't like you anymore. Well, this is not unreasonable, right? But it also is something that we cannot afford as a species. This is going to be very difficult. And, and I would say that, that most, most scientists would never say this in public. But when they're talking among scientists, they will say, we don't think that's going to happen. And this is, this is the, what we call the Cassandra Collective. Okay, so the, the myth of Cassandra. Cassandra was um, the sister of Paris who stole Helen of Troy and started the whole thing off. Well, when Cassandra was a priestess of Athena, Apollo tried to seduce her, and she wouldn't let him. And so he cursed her. He said... I'm going to curse you. I'm going to make, I'm going to give you the curse of true prophecy. Everything you say will be true, but no one will ever believe it. And so she was the one who said, I really don't think you should bring that wooden horse inside the city. And clearly that's a, a motif. Okay, the reason there's a mythical figure like that is because 3,000 years ago, human beings recognized that there were always people in their society who saw what was going to happen and warned about it, but it seemed so strange that nobody would, would listen to them. And so when we say, you know, it's easy for a scientist to say, okay, time for all the countries on the world to cooperate and not be enemies anymore. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a typical scientific statement, right? Now, in the real world <laughs> of social science, you know, all of our social science uh, colleagues just go, 
what is wrong with you scientists? This is not going to happen. We have, you know, give us something we can work with. But we're, we are rapidly approaching a point where if we don't do something, something's going to happen anyway. And the biggest issue, we have a, a focus group on sustainability in, in Kursig at the, the Institute for Advanced Study in, in Kursig. And there is an emerging sense that the, 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 the most important element of sustainability now has nothing to do with growth or development. It has to do with survival. And 10, 15 years ago, nobody doing sustainability work was thinking about sustainability in terms of basic human survival. Now that's what we have to think about. We have to start with what do we need in order to survive? Well, the reality is in a highly technological, highly interconnected, highly globalized world economy, individual places, no individual place on this planet is self-sufficient. So we either cooperate globally or we find networks of cooperators. We find networks of people that we can cooperate with. But countries that decide that it will not happen to them, as far as we're concerned, are dead. And, and sadly, that includes my country. Right now, NASA estimates that the drought that is beginning in North America will last until 2050. So that, that date keeps coming up, right? And by 2050, the United States will have lost between 35 and 65 percent of its food production. If it loses 35 percent of its food production, it ceases to exist as a global economic entity because that's what the United States economic it's all of its trade is based on food surplus. Plus, all the countries that, that rely on American food surpluses will be faced with severe food shortages. If it's more than 35%, the United States will be in a position where it will need to beg food from all the many friends it's been making for the last 30 or 40 years on this planet. This is not a good situation. The American national strategy for dealing with emerging diseases is, and I kid you not, it is, it will never happen here. That's their plan. That's why they're denying that there's Zika in North America, even though there's Zika babies in 44 states out of 50. That's why they're denying, they're saying that Zika is a mosquito-transmitted disease when it is primarily a sexually transmitted disease that can also be transmitted by mosquitoes during the summertime. They're in denial, and it's going to kill them as a, as a culture. They're in denial about disease. They're in denial about food production. They're in denial about sea level rises. The, the storm that, that devastated Houston, Texas last summer, that was a seven meter sea level uh, uh, storm surge. That's equivalent to a seven meter sea level rise, except it would be global and forever. 120,000 years ago, this planet had the same amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as it has now, and it was the same temperature as it is now. And sea levels were seven meters higher than they are now. The specialists who work on sea level rise problems are really worried because they don't know why the, the big one hasn't happened yet. They don't know what the planet's waiting for. And the longer this goes, the warmer things get, the greater, without some big release, the greater the possibility that it's going to be a catastrophic change when it happens. And, and if, this, you know, if this is all happening at more or less the same time in the next 30 years, this is, we, we really are not prepared to, to, to survive, which is terrible because we have all the ability to survive if we want to. 
I mean, all that technology in these cities that could be at risk is exactly the source of policies and programs that could enable us to survive. So mostly what I'm doing these days is just trying to beg humanity to save itself. Because, like I said, I've got, I have a daughter, I have some Hungarian stepsons, I've got some American grandchildren, and, you know, I actually care about them. And, and in some strange abstract way, I would feel really bad if I lived long enough to see that before I died, things were going to be really bad for them. I would feel somehow responsible for that as a scientist. So evolutionary biology is really, really important, but nowadays there is no kind of basic biology, no kind of basic science that can be done without thinking about the consequences of global climate change and, and what, we, what we need to do about it. So I know I've dragged on long and I've, and I've made you, like I said, I was going to ruin your day, but hopefully for some of you, I will, will have helped, especially for graduate students, I've helped give you some ideas for how you might change your life and things that you might do to try to ensure your future. Thank you. So now everybody needs a drink. <laughs> or you're just, or, yeah, either a drink of vodka or a drink of hemlock. We drink honey. Don't drink vodka. Oh, okay. Dunki. Вітаєте аудиторії, як і інститутом, де ми як вірус. І у нас питання впливу змін клімату на нашу країну і на людей піднімалось вже років 10 тому Івановичем Францевичем. І дуже жаль, що його тут немає, тут було б про що побалати. Але, будь ласка, ваші питання. Anything clear? <laughs> yeah. When you say that uh, the host range includes species uh, in the past, from the past, uh, do you mean uh, they are went extinct uh, on parts of their ranges, and uh, so now the remaining uh, ranges of these hosts do not not right. Right. But, I mean, and this is, this is exactly right. Suppose we have, imagine a conservation biology project in which you want to reintroduce a species that has gone extinct in part of its range, and you're going to reintroduce it. How many programs for such reintroductions incorporate the likelihood that the, re the reintroduction is going to increase the chances of disease. Nobody, okay? Now, one of, one of our, our good friends um, in, in, in Budapest, Gabor Fudvari, works, he's a, uh, he works with ticks and tick-borne diseases, acrologist at the vet school. And Gabor, in, in Budapest, there's a big island in the middle of the Danube called Margaret Island. And it's a big, it's a recreational area, there's sports clubs there, there are rock concerts there, there are tourists, tourism is a major tourism site, major recreational area for people. Gabor uh, began looking at the ticks on the hedgehogs on Margaret Island. And he discovered that the abundance of ticks on hedgehogs on Margaret Island is 10 times higher than in the forests. And not only that, but all of those ticks are loaded with rickettsial pathogens. But there hadn't been any, any major disease outbreak on Margaret Island, even though there was this, the, the people were wandering in a, in a soup of, of disease. Why not? Well, it turns out that most of the island, most of the public places, the grass is cut short. And so the ticks don't have tall enough grass to climb up on and, and wave for hosts. 
The only place they can do that is in the forested areas, the areas where there are trees, where they don't cut the grass. Okay? So if you don't go into that part of the park, you're, you're never going to come into contact with a tick that could give you Rocky Mountain spotted fever or one of these other tick-borne diseases. But the government of Hungary had only two public toilets on Margaret Island because they were worried about people having sex in public toilets, especially ugh, gay sex. They were so worried about that, there were only two public toilets on the entire island, and they were only open from 9 in the morning until 5 at night. And Gabor said, look, <laughs> the reality is that gay sex in public bathrooms is a lot less of a problem than ruining your entire tourism industry because Budapest becomes known as a place where you can go into the park and die. So now there are public toilets all over the island. And it turns out, I mean, the government paid attention and, and, and understood that the immediate cost of putting extra public toilets out there was very, was tiny compared to the cost of a major outbreak that could, you know, people getting sick during a rock concert, boom, nobody ever comes back. And, and that's, a, that's a major part of their, I mean, tourism is a major part of Budapest's economy. That's a major part of Budapest's tourism industry. Uh, and so the government understood that this was something that would cost them a small amount of money now to make sure that they would never have to pay a huge price later. And it's, it's the best example we know of, of this kind of thing. But the problem is that if that's true for ticks on hedgehogs on Margaret Island, it's true for every city on the planet that's trying to increase the green space in the city. I was in Brazil at, at the end of, of February, and I gave this talk, and three people came up to me just like this, and they said, we're, you know, we, we've been hired by Brazilian cities to design to make them greener, and you're telling us this? And I said, yep. And they said, well, that probably explains why Sao Paulo, which is a city of 20 million people, just closed all of its city parks because of yellow fever and malaria transmission. They've closed all of their city parks. So there's nothing we can do that doesn't have, some, you know, there's nothing we can do to try to make things better that doesn't also have potential costs. I and mean, this is another, you know, this is another really important evolutionary principle. Everything that happens in evolution has costs as well as benefits. And if we only think about the benefits, that's what's happened with biological control. Nobody ever anticipated that the biological control agent could be released in a new place and find a local host that it liked better than the target host. And it keeps happening over and over and over and over again. And we keep thinking, next time it'll be okay. Next, next time we have it figured out. But there's, there's all this potential and green spaces in large cities for all of the benefits that they're going to provide, the, eco service, the ecosystem services, right? One of the ecosystem services is an increase in zoonotic disease potential. So, so actually what we should be doing is we should have no green spaces inside central cities. We should have free mass transportation out to the periphery and all of our green spaces should be out there. And we should make mass transit free to people to encourage them to go out and, and relax in a green space. But the more green spaces we intersperse in our cities, the more we're increasing the chances of zoonotic disease outbreak. And that's going to offset the extra oxygen the trees are producing. More questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask a very impressive talk, but are there any recipes what country or government have to do 
because everything looks very uh, scary. Mm -hmm. What we have to do? First step, uh, step, second step, third step. Are there any programs elaborated? How to mitigate yeah. all situations? Like yeah. it's softer, like it's not well, it's, it's a, a two-part answer. <laughs> okay. The first answer, the first part of the answer is that there's a very well articulated protocol, what we call the Dhamma protocol. Yes. But the bad news is that it's not being implemented anywhere. And and we're in this funny what we call a catch twenty-two situation. It's it's um so, for example, uh, Gabor and I and, and some other people were in Munich in, in April. We were going to try to apply, there's an, an EU program called a cost program, which is a grant. Basically, that's money that the EU would give EU people to build a network of researchers to, to then get the big money to do a, a program. So we were going to do this, get the money to bring together a network of researchers. And they do it this way because the initial money can only go to EU members, okay, all the, the people on the grant. But once the EU gives them the money, they can bring in people from anywhere in the world to be part of, of their network of specialists. Then you have a global network of specialists uh, who will increase your chances of success with other, other grant proposals. And we wanted to do this with, with Dhamma. And one of the people who was there is, is a guy from Norway who's part of the, the One Health network. You know, he's very highly placed in, placed in the One Health thing. And he said, he said, look, this is, this is wonderful and this is exactly what we need to do. But I'm telling you right now that nobody who's going to review these proposals knows what the Dhamma protocol is. And the reason nobody knows what the Dhamma protocol is is because the book that we wrote that was supposed to be published by now is not published. And the reason for that is because we submitted the manuscript last June, almost one year ago. A month later, the science editor at the University of Chicago Press left to become the director of the Princeton University Press. The University of Chicago Press took 10 months to hire a new science editor. And during that time, none of their science projects could be approved to go forward. So we were getting reviews saying, you've got to publish this now. You've got to publish this now. This is really important stuff. You know. So now it will come out sometime in 2019. And so the guy from Norway, who was at this meeting in, in Munich, said, there is no point in applying for this grant this year. It will not get funded because nobody knows what you're talking about. If the, if the book is published next year and is out for two or three months before the deadline for the grant, then you can submit it next year, and then the reviewers will have some idea of what you're talking about. So this is a situation, we even talk about this in the book, about how bureaucracy is killing us. I mean, the problem with bureaucracies are wonderful as long as nothing changes. I mean, how many of you have gone to, you know, something, you know, some simple part of bureaucracy like the post office or any kind of government bureaucracy, and you start to say, I've got a little bit of a problem. Instantly, the body language is like, mm -hmm. so if you go in and say, here's the protocol, I followed the protocol, here it is, oh, that's great, here's the receipt, bop, bop, bop. Bureaucracies are designed to be very rigid. That's the essence of their efficiency. So bureaucracies, and we are a bureaucratized species now, bureaucracies are terrible at responding to changes. And that's, that's this, this particular situation. The, the managing editor at the University of Chicago is he does not understand why we're upset because in his mind they've done a really good job. We're a really important press so we should take a long time to make sure we get exactly the right person. And we're going, if things are going to go terribly wrong by within 30 years, you have just cost us 3% of the time that we have left. You know, doing your due diligence and making sure you got exactly the right person. And that's because if, if you're, you know, if, if, if you're at the University of Chicago Press, 
all this climate change stuff is very abstract to you. Your life is fine. I mean, in fact, the winters are a little bit warmer in Chicago, so it's, it's, everything's good. You're not seeing any shortages in the grocery stores. So, so you know, that's a, so yeah, we know, we know exactly, this is the frustration. We know exactly what to do. And as soon as somebody decides, it's like we built a Ferrari, but we have no gasoline, <laughs> right? As soon as somebody starts to pour gasoline into the tank, we, we, had, a, we had a workshop in, in, uh, at, at Lake Bolaton last October, and there was, there was really broad agreement that this, this would work, this is how we do it, and it's a combination of working with, with local people in local villages and networking with, with specialists, science specialists, and policy people. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll talk about this in Ascania. My, my talk in Ascania will, will, will be about that protocol because that's where you have to talk about it, is out in the local people. Sasha, more questions? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it sounds like, it sounds a little bit like we're just expecting the last season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how your, your, your lecture sounds. We really are expecting. What will be in the Zoom and early or later? Everybody will die. Is well, correct? okay. Here, here's, here's what I want. Okay, I want us to to react to possibilities the same way your military does. The same way the the United States military is the organization in the United States that spends more money on climate change data from the National Research Council than any other organization in America. And I guarantee you that every organized military in every country on this planet has contingency plans for not just for climate change in particular or in general, but pandemics, sea level rise, big storms, and all these, all these sorts of things. And Nobody thinks that it is a waste of money for military people to anticipate problems so that they never happen. Okay, one of the reasons countries like China and the United States and Russia spend so much money trying to anticipate potential conflicts between them is based on the assumption that all those countries are all doing the same thing and that they're all going to come to the same conclusion that this would not be good for anybody, so then it doesn't happen. So nobody thinks that it's a waste of money to plan for wars that we never have to fight. But imagine what the reaction would be if, if some military leader said, oh, we never saw that coming. We never saw that as a possibility. I mean, that person would be dead in 20 minutes. So, you know, the, the military people are... Um, extremely pragmatic and it is the the US military is the only organization of the United States government right now that actually takes climate change seriously and this is this is a good thing and a bad thing because in the American system of government if there is a major pandemic even if the military has a plan they cannot simply implement the plan because there's strong civilian control of the military. And so right now, if there was a major pandemic in the United States, the Pentagon would have to ask Donald Trump for permission to do something about it. So, what do you do? Well, there's an election in November. <laughs> you know, the American people can decide to not vote stupid this time. I mean, this is a, it's a very strange thing because a lot of this is all about personal responsibility. You know, in the United States, 45% of the reason we have Donald Trump is because 45% of American voters did not vote because they have no confidence in the system at all anymore. I mean, that's a, that's a terrible thing. 45% of Americans have no confidence in the American form of government. 
because they looked at the two candidates and said, they're both losers. Yeah, one of them's psychotic, but they're both losers. Neither one of them is, any, is particularly good. So, well, you know, if you vote stupid, you get stupid. And, and um, so that's, you know, that's one of the things I keep doing, like with my family, for example, who think Donald Trump was the best thing that ever happened because, you know, at least he's not black. Um, I keep telling them that, you know, Trump is, Trump is a symptom of something. Trump's not a cause of any of this. Trump's a symptom of something else because the United States is not the only participatory democracy where voting has decreased significantly over the last 30 years. The only countries where voting has not decreased are countries where voting is, is mandatory by law, where you have to pay a fine if you don't vote. But every country that has voluntary voting, every democratic representative democracy that has voluntary voting over the last 30 years, including Canada, has seen this happen. People are beginning to worry that, that democratic governments are not capable of responding rapidly enough and effectively enough to things like climate change. On the other hand, they don't know what the alternative would be. So, you know, so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying we're all dead, but I'm saying that if we don't start doing something right now, we will be. And, and the, the only good news in this is that we actually, the scientific community as a whole, actually has a pretty good idea of what we could do. But there's no place on this planet where scientists can act, can enact social programs by themselves. So every, every scientist on this planet needs policymaker, politician, somebody, government official to implement the plan. I have a question after just such a long discussion, by the way. Thank you very much for your so pathetic presentation about our future. You know, you probably ruined our day. Nevertheless, what I wanted to stress, actually, your presentation was more philosophical, I guess so, and analytical. Uh, would I suggest that your uh, book uh, has uh, much more scientific data and facts? Because everything should be based on facts, maybe hundreds of facts, are proving just climate changes and claim, uh, proving also appearance of new epidemics in, globally. So because uh, thinking globally, we need to think uh, locally. At least uh, thinking about uh, our uh, nation and city, would uh, we say that uh, new possible diseases come into every city, a uh, possibility of that had been proved on some cases, like in Zika virus or other viruses, which changed their host. For example, this paper, this paper, this paper. Maybe these papers have been mentioned in your book as well. Are any fem or many facts about such changes of specialization uh, for paras parasites and for pathogens as well? How many of them? Just few or dozens or hundreds? Well, we were, we were restricted in our, in our book the editors told us to restrict our bibliography to less than 1,500 1, references out of about 12,000 that we have. It's, the reality is we don't, we in fact don't know of any publications that, that have, have not found this pattern. Mm -hmm. Humans go into jungles, they leave their trash there, they leave their stuff there, they everything there. 
uh, should we have primates uh, that will include in increase their uh, parasites in time? The oh yeah, 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 yeah. A major, a major, <laughs> one of the major uh, uh, reservoirs of Zika in Brazil right now is spider monkeys, and human beings gave it to them. Oh, I see. And one of the things that I was, I was in Brazil. I was with with Walter. I was in Brazil on a Ciencia Sem Fronteras fellowship in 2014, 15, and 16. 2014, the Zika business began to blow up. And my, my colleague there, Walter Bieger, went to the Brazilian government and said, you have got to start monitoring the non-human primates because Zika is going to get into them and, then, and then, it's, then you'll never get rid of Zika. And they said, no, 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 no. It's not, you know, it's not going to get into... These things don't host switch. They have to wait till there's a genetic mutation, and it's not going to happen. And now, the Zika's in the in the, the spider monkeys. Uh, there are uh, the strain of yellow fever from the most recent outbreak in in uh, in uh, Minas Gerais state in Brazil. That's the strain of of yellow fever that's showing up in the howler monkeys in Brazil now. So there's there's an enormous amount of things moving in both directions. And one of the things that, that, that we know em empirically is that if you have a pathogen that's causing disease in one species of host, you can be certain that there's another species of host that is the reservoir of that, that pathogen. And we don't know about it because that host is not diseased, so we don't pay any attention to it. That's where the finding them before they find us comes from. So part of the protocol is that we need to be really focusing on the interfaces between you know, green spaces and urban spaces, urban spaces and, the, and agricultural, agricultural and wildlands, uh, because that's where, I mean, I guarantee you that there are a whole lot of, of pathogens that are being transmitted between wild boar and domestic pigs in this country. And... Um, you know, and there are, there are other things like Borreliosis, Lyme disease, that's now, we now know it's, it's, you know, there are 18 different species of Borrelia in Hungary alone. And um, they, each one has a different reservoir, and oftentimes the reservoir is something we never thought about. Um, so, so you're right, and, and, the, and one of the things that's interesting in the history of parasitology, we have an enormous number of studies of Parasites that get transmitted to really funny hosts in zoos. And we've always just dismissed those. Oh, you can't trust that. Of course, everybody's stressed and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is all these zoo records give us an indication of, of who could be susceptible if the conditions were right. Sasha. Excuse me, but uh, is parasites uh, uh, transmitted to Do not have disease. Is this not an example of coevolution? No. <laughs> it's it's an example of of two species that are capable of living together. Okay, I mean it's coevolution if you want to say that you know the entire biosphere is coevolved. And you know, I mean that's that's kind of the view that James Lovelock likes to likes to promote the Gaia hypothesis and everything where everybody's just getting along together really fine. Uh, but, but one of the things that's interesting, um, Roy Anderson and, and Robert May published a series of models in the, in the late 1970s. So 40, more than 40 years ago, they published a series of mathematical models that showed that there is no necessary connection between pathogenicity and uh, the persistence of a pathogen in a host. So that just because you're not causing disease doesn't mean you're, you're going to be able to survive in that host for a long time. Even if you're highly pathogenic, you're not necessarily going to go extinct from that host. The, the issue of, of whether disease is being caused or not is an emergent property of something else. So for example, if, if you, you know, if we, for example, with Ebola, right? The, the impression is that if you get Ebola, you die. And in some cases that's true, but in some cases it's only 20% of the people who get Ebola die. And that's because 
we don't we quote unquote don't understand that because we haven't been studying the population genetics of Ebola. And it turns out that uh, the the different reservoir hosts of Ebola in different parts of Africa have different strains of Ebola, and those strains have have differential degrees of of impact on on hosts like humans where it can't persist. Ebola can't persist in humans for more than six weeks. But um, it could be that you could be having coevolutionary dynamics and pathogenicity. It could be that you could be having coevolutionary dynamics and nothing. But neither one of those is, is necessary. And that's one of the reasons why we have all these models about very tight coevolution. And almost to speak to this gentleman's point, almost no published cases in which it's been documented experimentally. I mean, this is one of the weird things about the coevolutionary arms race. Everybody just says it's happening, but we actually have almost no experimental studies that, that document it. Um, but, um, doesn't it mean that uh, even if uh, new, uh, new parasites will uh, spread, uh, the economic uh, results may not be so drastic? Initially, that's, that's true. I mean, that, that's a really good point. If, if you have pathogens, that, that's why I said before that the, the geographic distribution of a pathogen is not the geographic distribution of disease caused by that pathogen. So it's very common. You, there, there are undoubtedly pathogens in Ukraine now that are not causing disease now, but could because they cause disease someplace else. And there are a complicated number of reasons why that might be or not might not be. The, the, the issue is if, it's, if uh, pathogens moving into new hosts is more a matter of opportunity than capacity. So if, they, if we think that they always have greater capacity than they manifest, we have to be worried. So if something is, and this is, again, this is part of the protocol that, that Tatiana was asking me about. There are two kinds of things. If we go and we begin inventorying, say we want to do all the viruses in rodents in Ukraine, okay? Now, are we going to spend enormous amounts of time on every single virus that we find? No, of course not. We don't have the time and money to do that. So what is the triage? What do we focus on? We would focus on viruses that are known to cause disease someplace else, even if they haven't caused disease here yet, and that's good because now we, we know they're here. Okay? Or something that's very closely related to something that causes disease someplace else. So those are the two kinds of pathogens we want to focus in on. So the primary triage of, of, of pathogen inventories is, is phylogenetic analysis. You collect an enormous number of things. You, you look at them phylogenetically. If they are known pathogens, or if they're close relatives of known pathogens, then you spend more time on them. If they're not, you ignore them. Because most of the pathogens that are in your body right now are not causing you disease. Like everybody in this room has streptococcus in their throat. Nobody has a strep throat infection. But any of you might. It's if you get stressed, if you get too tired, you, major professors causing you too many problems, the reviewers are nasty, you get all upset, then you could, you could have a strep throat outbreak. Now, if you go to the doctor, the doctor is more than likely going to treat a streptococcus infection as a drug deficiency. Oh, you have streptococcal infection, here, take streptomycin, leave. Next. That's because doctors are not scientists. They're like automobile mechanics. They're just, all they're doing is trying to suppress the symptoms. Now, I know this because my father was a doctor, and my father was the first president of a group of, of very radical American physicians called the Society for Clinical Ecology. It was the forerunner of environmental medicine. So my father was, was talking about environmental problems, environmental health problems in the 1950s, and his colleagues hated him because, you know, he would, he would say, let me find out why this person keeps having a sore throat. Oh, it's because you're not getting enough sleep. 
get, get more sleep, and then you never need to spend money on drugs anymore, you never need to spend money on the doctor anymore. Because the cause of the disease is your fatigue, it's not a deficiency of a drug. And so he taught me that most of what physicians are taught to do is suppress symptoms. And he taught me that physicians are always taught to be really conservative. Do no harm. Do no harm, right? Do no harm in an era of climate change means wait until there's an epidemic and then put on the spacesuits and go in and try to do something about it. But by that time, it's too late. And nobody understands where do no harm comes from. Nobody understands that today's modern medicine has a philosophical basis that goes back to a legal code that said, if you're a doctor and you treat someone for an eye infection and they lose the sight of that eye, we're going to take your eye out. That's called an eye for an eye. If you treat someone for a tooth infection and they lose that tooth, your tooth is pulled out, and that's called a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got to do with making medical practitioners really conservative about what they do to their patients. That was 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, and we still do this. We still go, oh, I don't know. You know, we better wait and see what happens here. And then when the disease blows up, then you can get to be a big hero because you go in and you do everything you can and... You know, if it doesn't work well, it was God's will that everybody should die in the town or something. But this is crazy because it's not, it's not science. It's not what we know. And we can, we can actually, we can do better. Well, let us Maybe you should come to Escania with us. We can talk over the train all night. In <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. To Professor Brooks and thank you for your attention and coming. Thank you.